Welcome to the Revitalized Virtual Thoughts, episode number one, and I'm here with John Troyer, formerly of VMware and now of Tech Reckoning. A what, what, what does Tech Reckoning do, John? <laughs> when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Uh, we're we're an independent IT community. Um, we right now it's instantiated as a mailing list, and we're about to have our first event in July of this year uh, here in uh, foggy Half Moon Bay. We're going to come together and talk about how to do IT well, how to be communicators as IT professionals, and then also how to, um, you know, careers, entrepreneurship, you know, how to, how to, how to navigate when in a, in a profession that is very process driven. Well, it's also not just process driven. It's very just driven by technology as well. I mean, you have yes. people that are just, Hey, I'm really good at this technology and they have to be able to move as it goes around wherever it's going. You always have to be try to go where the puck is going, right? Because we all have long careers, right? We have decades ahead of us, and uh, yeah. I really think that today technologists have almost more power than ever, right? Because uh, the technology is changing so fast. We have access to the internet and social media, open source, uh, everything as a service. So the days where you just kind of waited for the golf game to finish to figure out which ERP system you were going to get, you know, that's over, right? We've got to drive. The technologists have to drive what's going or else uh, we're not adding value. Absolutely. So today we want to talk about containers. Um, there's so many different containers out there. I mean, we're talking about Docker as a container technology. They have Docker for Windows. They have some other Windows te container technologies. Almost application can virtualization can be considered a container technology. Sure. Virtual machines are a container con te technology. And you got Revello, which is containers with inside containers with inside containers. you got Docker, which could be I mean, you think about that, that's going to be inside of a cloud that's going to be a container within another container. And then you have the old Cheroot jails that have been around since the 1970s. LXC, things like that? Yeah, LXC, which is nothing more than Docker, really. <laughs> Basically. But, yeah. but Cheroot jails, 1970s, they came out as a security concept. But they're not used that way anymore. It's more for other things. What's your take? Sure. We've obviously we've seen a rapid uptake uh, in the use of containers. I mean, we used to talk about them back in the day uh, when I first started VMware in 2005. You know, we talked a lot about containers and about uh, uh, container technology from um, oh Virtuoso and a couple of other people uh, who's who's now they became Parallels, I guess. Well, Virtuoso um, split to become Odin. Oh, okay. So sorry. Now, Parallels anyway. is now and they have a company called Odin, which is a virtuoso based cloud, which is nothing oh, more gotcha. than a Cheroot jail type of Exactly. So we were kind of concerned about it back in the day, but the reasons we thought people would go with uh, uh, VMware was uh, the portability of the pay of the workload, right? Uh, VMware was very good at Windows and then security and isolation. Uh, and so uh, that, those were some of the drivers at that point. I, I think a lot of the, some of the benefits that we're seeing and some of the reasons we're driving it is very developer driven, right? You've got speed, you've got time to value for developers. If you think one of the reasons that VMs were popular was was consolidation. Uh, I think the, the job to be done for containers is more about uh, speed for developers. It, the, the, some of the characteristics of these copy on write file, file systems and things like that make, make uh, if you are a developer and you are doing continuous integration and you are or you are you know you're compiling multiple times a day uh, the so something like docker can speed up your workflow immensely even though it just would take a few minutes for a vm container to spin up rather than a, a docker container or a you know a, a os well, level container. I, i've been a developer for a very long time i got very, two but yeah go ahead i've been a developer for a very long time that's how i started my career and to be honest compiling all the time I don't compile into containers, never have, and maybe I will in the future, but I don't see it as a way to speed up my workflow. So, mm -hmm. But for some people, of these new cloud-style cloud apps, people do, people do daily builds, people do continuous builds, right? Well, I do continuous and daily builds, and I've been, I mean, for example, with one customer I just had, I just built four times this morning in mm -hmm. a half-hour period as we fixed problems and came across new issues. So we are doing that, and developers are used to that. It's all part of testing, but what I'm really, I think the container really helps you is not with development. That's just going to happen. You've got to develop in the container in order to be able to deploy in the container. I think that's the big win over the container. Is, portability. portability. Is deployment of changes, deployment of whatever, and portability. But 
Docker containers are not incredibly portable. Not yet. <laughs> They're portable to anything that's running Docker, any Linux kernel that's running Docker. Docker. Um, well, and the right library subset underneath, and the right yes. this, and the right that, and no one's really figured that out yet. And so that but you have to you, actually have the, yeah. if you have start with something like Core OS or, or something like that nature, it's a very limited subset. And Linux has, Red Hat has there as well. Mm -hmm. When you start thinking about that, yes, but everything then gets put into the container. So anything extra yes. gets placed in that container, and then I can move it as long as the base OS has the necessary kernels and drivers and whatnot to make it work. But there's actually a third thing. So, so, but it does make it really easy to compile something on my laptop and then shoot it off into any sort of cloud or for the production. Finally, dev is the same as production because you have this abstraction layer. We, we thought Absolutely. we had it with VMs and now this is another layer of, of even more uh, uniform abstraction. But there is a third thing, Edward, that I think you'll like, which is that what I see people doing with these containers is treating them more like um, closed boxes. Uh, they, they, they see them as immutable because uh, you can do, I see them people using them for config management and just because of the way that the tool set works, you are less, and you are less inclined to go uh, SSH into them and screw with stuff. You are more inclined just to kill them and start a new one if, if something is broken. And so I've seen people compare that with tools like Chef and Puppet, and they say, you can do exactly the same things, but when I have a long-lived VM with, with something like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, whatever, uh, I have a tendency to, it has a tendency to drift over time, that, that workload. But well, with I would Docker, agree with you. And you have a much shorter-lived uh, container, and so they find that it is safer, in, in not necessarily in, in many senses of that word, because, because it, they can treat it as more immutable. Well, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's a self-contained environment that you can maintain and the developer can maintain and they're using it inside their, using it inside what they're developing in is the same thing they're going to be running in production. But I have actually heard that that's not the case. <laughs> I think people, developers are developing in Docker containers, yet people are trying to push them out to standard environments without Docker. And I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. Mm. It becomes the, the people deploying have trouble understanding what they did. So there's this gap on communication that happens all the way through. A developer just can't willy-nilly say, hey, I'm going to use Docker, and that's the way we're going to go forward. Oh, if the yeah. people in production aren't also using the bits that make Docker work. Absolutely. There's a big gap in understanding between dev and ops in this case. Yes. And I don't see that changing for traditional apps. I only see it changing for the modern app it'll be a process over time right i mean even virtual machines took 15 years to really get going 10 or 15 years so we processes change slowly 15 uh, years i actually more like five yeah yeah but i mean you know if you could if you think if yeah you know it's, it what depends on what part of the tail you look at right i'm just saying to get all the way down the tail to where we are now it took 15 years for vmware to do it right well to get to where we are now you're absolutely right yeah. but i mean people have been definitely <laughs> We've been using it for a long time. Well, I yeah, have, oh, and a bunch of other people have. Yeah, 2005, it was pretty clear what was what the hell was going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, Docker still has a lot of problems in production. Uh, some of the problems with persistent storage aren't solved. Some of the problems with networking aren't solved. Uh, and certainly some of the problems with isolation and security aren't solved. I certainly wouldn't use Docker in a multi-tenant solution. You know, so I think a lot of those well, things Well, I wouldn't use Docker solved. as a multi-tenant solution. I would use Docker within a tenancy. In a VM, maybe I don't know. I, I don't well, know. You can't, well, you can't run Docker in anything but a VM, or Docker on Linux in a, in a virtuoso mm -hmm. container. You can well, run you Docker can run on bare metal, man. You can run it on bare metal, but most clouds are not bare metal. Sure, but I think we're going to see we're going to see those spin up. Um, not as not as I don't think so. I don't know if they're going to work or not, but I think we'll see them spin up. Um, actually, I really don't think so. The okay. only way they would spin up is if someone really heavily invests in something like Moonshot, mm -hmm. where each cartridge would be a, its own Linux, which you, and you could run your own containers inside so, of that. But I think what you have is a migration problem still. This is a problem with clouds, is that if you design your app poorly, resiliency is going to be a problem. Even with Docker today, any container you use is a resiliency issue. 
So what do you mean by resiliency? Because for cloud native apps, that's not so much of an issue like it is for cloud Flex native apps. apps. You have to design the resiliency into the application. Correct. Okay, because you do know, I mean, like, for example, if the whole cloud has to reboot, which has happened so far every four months, <laughs> it's just going to happen and your, your state's gone unless your application understands that. Sure. If you're doing a traditional, let's say, LAMP stack, which is not cloud native, you throw that in a bunch of Docker containers, your Docker containers are going to be spread out all over. You still have to manage them. You still have to know what's there. You still have to have some way to say, where is my data? Mm, absolutely. You need to still have some way to say, okay, that doesn't belong over there anymore, and now I need to put it over there, or I'm migrating from Amazon to Azure or Azure to vCloud Air or from vCloud Air to SoftLayer, or I'm using all four of those to do my app. And it may be a traditional app that has this really whiz-bang front end, so the back end is more traditional, and the front end is more Docker-like. But you still have to plan for all this. So resiliency, Docker doesn't have resiliency. Sure. The app running inside of Docker has resiliency or has to. Yes. And I see that as a really big issue right now because most people don't design resilient distributed systems right. really well. Sure. And Docker doesn't help with that right now. You mean there's all sorts of add-ons like Flocker and SocketPlane and all that, but you now have data protection issues that have never been thought of before. Well, you just back up the container? Uh, not really, because not everything's in the container. I'm no. talking to a database that is not in the container. Well, there are many startups that are attacking problems like that, uh, talking the, the problem of stateful persistence and scale out persistence, uh, the security problems, the networking problems, the management problems, the scheduling problems, right? Because now it's a multi workload and multi machine scheduling problem, not just a scheduling problem on one machine that VMware solves. So well, I mean, all, people are attacking all that. And there's actually companies right now that have microservice controllers that can control a microservice, whether it's running in Docker or not, that, that that's, if they, they are that scheduling agent, that everything talks to them and they talk to them and say, okay, you run, you run, you run, okay, you run all the time and take this input and so forth. And that's actually kind of cool. So you can build up all these services running in containers and then hook, hit, stitch them together through another mechanism. Mm -hmm. Hey, Edward, I'm curious what you feel about the security issues with Docker and how people are addressing them. I know some of the, one of the more popular, uh, some of the secure Linux distros don't, don't support Docker yet. And then I think there are people, are, I know Red Hat was working on that, but um, you know, how do you feel, how do you feel like the direction of uh, security with containers in general? Uh, including the new OSs like uh, CoreOS and Atomic and, and the, those sorts of things are going to go? I'm, well, right now everybody says you use SE Linux with Docker containers or CoreOS or, or for any type of true root jail, and that's the way you do it. And I agree with them, but most people do not manage SE Linux very well. Mm -hmm. So they, they effectively ignore all the little bits that you can do and put it in permissive mode or just turn it off entirely because it will... It's a mandatory access system that can literally keep you from doing work if you control it incorrectly. It could even keep the root user from actually being able to make to log in to fix a problem. So there's all these things that most people just don't know how to run. I think that needs some serious love in the community. Hmm. They need hmm. a manager that crosses boundaries and manages the entire scope of the container. Uh, that was courtesy of our cat. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, what, doesn't he have his own Twitter handle now? <laughs> Troyer's cat is indeed a, a Twitter handle that actually I don't even know who runs it, but uh, <laughs> it's just coming to visit, maybe to go well, bad now gone to tweet. Um, no, so so we so we've got a. It's going to be interesting. I mean, you see a lot of int more concern about east-west traffic in the data center and how we are securing that and application level firewalls and that sort of thing. So now that we're going to have containers, that that short-lived containers coming in and out that all have to be in the correct, you know, protected by the correct application firewall, that could be interesting as well. Well, you, if you use SC Linux properly, you don't even need an application firewall. Hmm. I mean, it not control even in a multi not even in a multi-component system. 
you're not even in a multi-component system because the east-west traffic is governed quite well by SC Linux and what ports are open to what containers and so forth. Okay. There's multiple ways to do micro-segmentation. You don't necessarily need something built into the virtual switch. You can use other mechanisms to do it, and they've been doing it for years. The problem is, is that it's extremely hard to manage right now on Linux. So it comes down to, right? Always. Yeah, it, it's always going to come down to management and who actually builds the best tool to manage that. I'm a little more concerned about people think a container itself is secure. Mm. And that bothers me because a container is not. It's just it runs in the same memory as the everything else under that user. So if all it's the same user they have actually running in the same memory, so one container literally could read into another container. Unless you use the segmentation kernel, and there's actually only one segmentation kernel that's currently in use. Hmm. And that is um, Link Secure, which is a um, Zen or KVM hypervisor. Hmm. Using They do their, their protection between the VMs by turning on all the security features in the kernel. But they made it so it understood the processes that way. But a Docker may not be a process; it may be a part of a process. You know, I certainly think that we've seen the growth of all these platform as a service, these PaaSes, who are, use some sort of container technology. You know, like Cloud Foundry or uh, yeah. or the rest. And I, I, it remains to be seen whether it's going to, the the eventual solution we we end up on is going to be built from containers up or do we really actually need a pass? And will that take care of a lot of these problems? I think that's an, a conversation for another virtual thoughts because I, I, I want to bring in a few other people on that one, but it's an interesting question. Do we absolutely need one? I think it makes developers' lives easy not to have to worry about underlying layers, and that's why you use it. No, yeah, yeah. And think, to take care of some things like security, right? And networking well, and, you, and orchestration. You basically build in your security and hardening to the stack, and then you hope the developers code securely. I'm sorry, I've got a cat who's attacking me. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, John, thank you for this episode of Virtual Thoughts. It was very interesting. Thanks for having me here, Edward. I, I really enjoyed our conversation.